to reload that mono. What what I have to do just to keep you from, from struggling is I have to enable um, to debug uh, in the web config file. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. By, by default, it's not enabled. Right. So you can see here's where the connection strings are. There's actually two sets of connection strings. Those got automatically done by the by the uh, installer. Okay. But somewhere down here, we will find. This is all a lot of provider information. Hopefully, I'll search for a moment. Here's that cookie name that we were talking about earlier, too. Um, yeah. Okay. So, debug equals true will actually allow us to. So, now, hopefully, if I refresh the page. Taking a little longer, that's a good sign. Has to restart the process. As you said, yeah, you have to, yeah. You edited web config, so it's actually recycling the whole web, web process. That's why I say it take, it's taking a little longer, that's a good sign. So hopefully, what will happen is it, it'll stop in the. Yes, it should stop. Oh, I know what I have to do. Sorry. I did forget one other thing. Anybody have any guesses? Reference? No, yeah. The problem is that did you build it? I didn't build it. <laughs> right. So if you want to if you want to actually stop in design mode, you have to build it on this machine. So the, the the distribution that I have there was actually built against DNN version four. All right. So this is this reach versus depth thing again. I, I built it against DNN four so that it, that as a as a module that that people want to install, it'll run across the widest number of systems. The sort of the earlier back you, you build against, you know. It, so if you if you build against DNN 4.0, it'll run on 4.0 and anything later. Okay, if you build it against 4.5, it'll only run on 4.5 and everything later. All right. So you want to build it against as early of a version of .NET as possible to get the widest reach. If if you want if you want to create a public module. So what I have to do, I just stopped it. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, actually th this is where you need to. To check your references. See, my .NET reference is broken here. So I have to remove it and add it back. And there's two projects in here. You can see that the, the squiggly is telling me there's a problem. Come to all references. So basically, I'm just going to browse up two steps to the, the bin folder and just reference the .NET PLL. And the reason it's broken is because it was referencing a DNN, a DNN 4 DLL originally, and now it's a 5 DLL, and they're incompatible with each other. So I have to do that in both projects. So this time you have to go five steps. scenario of there we go. Sweet. Okay, so now you can step through your code and you can do all the normal developer things that you want to do as well. Okay. So I just hit run and it goes on. Alright, so so what we're um, what I started to say, I forget what I started to say. <laughs> um, but let me let me cover this topic of, of um, module type for just a minute. So this idea of, of uh, Public versus private modules. So if you're if you're a vendor who's building modules that you're going to sell, or you're a community member who's building modules that you're going to give away or whatever, you, you you're probably you're going to be building what's called a public module. And the idea here is you want it to run on as, as many people's DNN installations as possible. So you want to build against the lowest common denominator, the earliest version of .NET you can, the uh, framework two. You know, you don't, want, you don't want to use any of the real extensions inside of, of, uh, of uh, Framework 3.5, like Link or anything like that. 
Otherwise, you're limiting yourself very, very dramatically as to who can install and run the thing. On the other hand, if you're a corporate developer, you're building an intranet or you're building you know, custom, you're, you're a consultant building a custom module for a client, all right, that they're, they're, they're going to use internally, all right, you're building a private module now, and you're typically going to want to use things like Link and you know, Framework 3.5. You might build against BNN 5 directly, um, and that sort of thing. So you, you kind of have to have a, this clarity of what sort of module you're building and, and think about the environment that you're building into you know, uh, around those those kinds of considerations. Um, okay. So let me jump back to the slides. Talk a bit about the architecture, and then we'll look at the code in a little bit more detail. All right, you've got to sort of understand the architecture a little bit. We're building against it for you. <coughs> so this is the, the original architecture, <laughs> architecture picture that was in the original documentation from Dot New. And I just reused it here. So at the very bottom, <coughs> there's a the yellow box is the data access application block, which is a an enterprise library function. All right. If you if you're writing ADO.NET code yourself, don't use that thing. All right. It's it's silly to, to write ADO.NET code yourself. Just just reuse these these, these blocks. So it's it's tested code. It, it's going to work, and it's it's also optimized. So that new takes advantage of the data access application block. It actually does the ADO.NET, you know, raw calls out of the database, the, the secret database in this case. Above it, then, you've got something we call a concrete data provider. All right, and that's the code that's specific to the database that you're using. In our case, we're using SQL Server. So that concrete data provider is a SQL data provider. All right, you can also create, you know, the, the picture here shows access, but I think access <laughs> you really want to run not new from access either. So. So Oracle or MySQL are the, are the kind of databases you're probably you know, going to be building providers for here. All right, so that's, a, um, that's the piece actually that's removable, all right, that you can, you can switch out for a different provider if you want to use a different database, yeah. It, so like, let's say you build a MySQL provider, is it fully functional or are you going to be losing some of the core tools in there? Well, it's, it, I mean, you, you have to work within the limitations of the database. So, so I don't think they have stored procedures, for example, right? You know, so you have to build your, you have to build your code appropriate to the database platform that you're running. I mean, you still get the, the similar kinds of functionality, you know, without having stored procedures. But it, it, you know, you, you're, you're making a decision there about. You know, the, uh, if you want people who run MySQL to be able to run your you have to do it. So then the next step up the red box is the abstract data provider. All right. What that is basically is, a, is an interface definition for all of the functionality, all of the, essentially all the stored procedures or all the database functions that you're going to call from this module. All right. So it's, it's just the, uh, what, it, what it does, it's the, um, it's the universal interface okay, to the function of your module. So, you, so in the case of suggestions, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, a an add suggestion, a delete suggestion, an upset, a update suggestion, a get suggestion, a get suggestions, you know, to get a list of them, and, and so on. All right, so those those functions are going to be common no matter what database you're going to be using. So this abstract data provider just gives you the set of function calls that you're providing in that database interface. Okay. Then the middle layer is the business components, the business logic layer. All right, that's typically where you're going to write the logic, you know, the code that provides the functionality of this, whatever this module's application is. And at the top level, the white box is the user controls, and that's just the UI elements. All right, typically you don't want to put your business logic in the, you know, in the code behind of the, of the user controls. You want to put it in the business logic. Layer. So they created a nicely layered architecture here. You don't have to use this architecture. All right, you don't have to do it this way. You can do it. Any way that your company does internally, you don't have to use their data structures. You can use any, you can you can you can build .NET new modules any way you want to, as long as you end up with a set of user control at the top level that you register in the in the module definitions. Right? But if you want to be able to have your module run on different databases and that sort of thing, you have to you have to conform to this sort of a, a structure, unless you're going to do the work of porting your application to all these other databases yourself. So it makes sense to do it this way. And on top of that, as a developer, there's a bunch of um, uh, uh, like CodeSmith templates and things out there that actually generate most of this code. Most, the code from the business components down 